Kashgar to Islamabad, up through there to the Kunjarab Pass. It's a beautiful blue lake. Sand dunes on the other shore, it'd be a great place to stop and swim if not for one problem. We're at about 3,300 metres and we're below 10 degrees Celsius. And this magnificent landscape here reminds me of another thing about the Great Silk Road. We are now on what's modern day Karakoram Highway going from Kashgar down towards Islamabad or vice versa, which would then link up with the road that went over the Khyber Pass and into Afghanistan. You had to, in the old days, back in the Silk Road, pack for so many different climates, for altitude, for sub-zero, for snow, for desert, for 40 degrees, and all of that had to come with you on the back of your camel. I love the Karakoram Highway, overseen by these great mountains, majestic, stretching thousands of meters high, five, six, seven thousand meters. I feel like I'm coming home, not because it's like Australia, but because it's like Pakistan and the time I spent there. And this dusty road is the Karakoram Highway, soon to be replaced by a modern, brand new bitumen road. So trade can continue and expand up the modern new Silk Road. And this southwestern region of China remains at the cutting edge of some of the technological issues for the new Silk Road as well as the old Silk Road. The juxtaposition of these solar panels underneath this mountain range tells a good story. Economic development takes a lot of energy and few countries understand this in the way China does. And while many in the West might think of China as the world's biggest polluter, they're not the world's biggest polluter per head of population. That honour remains with Australia. And China is investing more in solar technology as a proportion of their economy than Australia is. They're investing more in wind as a proportion of their economy than Australia is. A few years ago, China started to degrid some of their basic infrastructure, like streetlights. And many of them now have their own solar panel and their own windmill, generating all the electricity that's needed to fire the streetlights with small batteries held underground. Underground because batteries don't work well in cold weather, and this gets to minus 30. So China is investing heavily in cold weather battery technology as well. And when you see this going up all throughout China, you wonder why Australia doesn't degrid a lot of their basic infrastructure. LED streetlights can well and truly run on freestanding power, either by wind or by solar. And indeed, just a few weeks ago, both China and the United States were criticizing Australia's greenhouse policy and its inability to meet the Paris targets. We emit more greenhouse gases per head of population than everybody else, and we are now lagging behind China in environmental standards. Think about that. More than any other country, China understands the fine balance between energy usage and economic development. And then as a middle class grows, the desire of the middle class to have clean air and clean nature. And it is one of the ongoing challenges for China to ensure that economic progress and environmental progress go hand in hand. And it's a fine balance for them to transition away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy, whilst not upsetting the economic growth strategy that they have. Whether they can achieve this fine balance is a critical issue for the entire globe. It's bloody windy outside, so I'm huddled inside the old kitchen area of this caravanserai which is at least 600 years old and they built the caravanserais near the rivers so you didn't have to cart water but also walking along the river's edges through mountains saved you going up and down too much and this old caravanserai is on the Karakoram highway about two three hours drive or about four five days walk outside of Kashgar and if you want to know what a caravanserai is think about it as an old Silk Road version of a motel and this was once a motel room. Next to this caravanserai is a summer village for the local Tajik people and the Tajik people here in China are still semi-nomadic so they have a summer village and a winter village 
and they've just left the summer one as we're about to huddle into winter as the cold wind and the ice capped mountains outside tell us. But the other thing this Tajik village shows is the blend of old and new, the old traditions with the new solar panels and the recycling of some car windows into the windows of their huts. And it is this juxtaposition between old and new that perhaps can introduce us to the last part or the last story of our journey to Western China. Behind me is the ancient stone city of Tashkagal. Tashkagal was founded 2,200 years ago and was the capital of one of the ancient 36 kingdoms. It is ethnically Tajik, which is no surprise given that we are a mere stone's throw from the modern day Tajikistan border just over there, the Afghan border just there, and the Pakistan border just down there. You can also imagine by its geography that through most of its history, this was an incredibly important town on the ancient Silk Road. It was the last town leaving China and the first town entering China. But nowadays, as the Silk Road has gone, you might think that Tashkagol is a backwater. And at the moment, it kind of is. It's in the region, a population of about 500,000 people, which in Australian terms would be a village of about four. But that's not to say the future for Tashkagol looks bleak. In fact, quite the opposite. The government of China has a one bridge, one road policy. It is one new sea road linking new and vital markets in a new seaborne silk road, including India and Pakistan, Southeast Asia, and in fact, many of the countries that have signed up to the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Unfortunately, Australia hasn't yet signed up to the one bridge, one road policy, which might be problematic for future generations and leave Australia more of a backwater than Tashkagol. The one bridge is a land bridge linking all the former uh, Silk Road countries and one or two in East Africa. This one bridge, one road policy was announced by President Xi in 2013. And so far they are planning multi-trillion, not multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar infrastructure investments shared by the one bridge, one road uh, countries. And you see new economic development happening right through Central Asia and an enormous amount of infrastructure being built in China to meet the one bridge, one road policy. Now, China is not doing this in an ad hoc way. They are in a very careful and well thought out way looking at options for future trade routes like the old North Silk Road and the old South Silk Road, there are very many roads, rail and gas pipelines that China are building. Just recently, China opened the new Beijing to Afghanistan Railroad with the Beijing to Karachi Railroad in Pakistan well under planning and indeed well under construction. There are new air routes that are coming in. New cargo routes have just opened up from Islamabad to Kashgar, for example. And what under President Xi's leadership, the Chinese government want to do is not just control all the sea routes, but all the road, rail and gas pipelines for most of the most important future trade. So next time you read in the newspapers something about China's policy in the South China Sea, think about that. And think about also the amazing geography that all the new Silk Road will go through, matching the amazing geography that the old Silk Road went through. So maybe I can conclude my video to China with that thought about the future. China, the country combined with India that had 87% of the global economy in the year 1500 and less than 10% of the global economy in the year 1950, is rising to the second most powerful economy in the world and will soon not rise to the most dominant, but return to the most dominant country in the world. And if you can't see the writing on the wall and plan for the future education of your children and position your country in a place which will be accepted as a trade and political partner for the new rising dominance, then you'll condemn your future to that. Or you can take the opportunity to be one of the critical countries in the new Silk Road.